What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Today, we've got a very special guest. We've got Alvin Irby in the building. Everybody clap it up. Hey, everybody. Focus, man. Appreciate you uh, tuning in with us. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be able to, you know, join you guys. Cool. So tell the world who Alvin Irby is. Who is Alvin Irby? You know, the one word I think I might use to kind of describe myself is boxlessness. What does that mean? You know, I think from a very young age, I've kind of uh, been kind of on my path. What does that mean? Well, I crochet. <laughs> I've been crocheting since I was seven. I do it on the subway. You know, I do it pretty much anywhere, uh, you know, when it gets a little cooler. Uh, and I think that kind of like willingness to kind of just go out and pursue things that are important to me or that I'm passionate about has kind of been a common thread through my life. I do stand up comedy, right? Um, it certainly isn't easy. <laughs> it's not always filled with laughter and applause breaks, um, but it's something that I pursued and that I've gotten better at over the years and that I genuinely just enjoy. And I think that I'm very fortunate, you know, to be able to have many areas of my life, including the work that I do with Barbershop Books, that yeah. really, I think, not only aligns with kind of my unique skill set, but also my passion. You know, I know everybody isn't fortunate enough to get paid or make money doing things that they're passionate about. So I would say that's, that's me. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. That's definitely a blessing to, to get paid to do something you love. Yeah. yeah. I know you love books and literature and things like that. So talk to us how like your passion for reading and just literature as a whole came, uh, came to be. When I was in high school, um, I was in regular English class, you know, in 10th grade. And I remember like, I was so bored. Like I was so bored. And I remember, you know, going to my counselor and just being like, hey, can you put me in any other type of class? And it wasn't even on some like, I want to be an intellectual. It was literally just, I was so bored. And when I switched into this pre-AP English class, all of a sudden we got to start reading novels. In my regular class, we were reading short stories, doing spelling tests. And then I switched into this other class, this advanced English class. We got to read novels, write book reports. And one of the most interesting things I observed was that all of a sudden the class became a lot more diverse. And by diverse, I mean, it was white kids in the class. In my regular class, it was all black and Latino. I switched into this advanced class. All of a sudden there are these other students. And you know, for me, it really bothered me. And I didn't really have the language to kind of articulate things like institutionalized racism or anything like that, but I just knew something was wrong. And so it inspired me to uh, the next year to survey about 200 of my classmates to find out what their reading habits were. And I found out most of them didn't read. And I, so I ended up running for student council president, designing a little reading incentive program, getting a grant from Barnes and Noble. And for me, this experience, even though it was, you know, years and years ago back in high school, one of the reasons why I think it's important to share is because it was that experience that kind of taught me that my ideas matter. Yeah. And not only did they matter, but that my ideas could actually inspire a high school English teacher who already has a lot of work to volunteer her time or his time to review entries for this program. So I would say that was kind of what led me on the path to kind of promoting literacy, even though I didn't think of myself as a literacy advocate at that time. For sure. So now at this time, you were like a literacy advocate and you teach you how to read and things of that nature. So what would you say is one of like the greatest joys of being an educator? Um, <clears throat> I think it, for me, it's, witnessing those moments of discovery. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, grad school at Bank Street in this art class, I remember the talking to us about like, you know, you want to, you know, whenever you can, you want to give kids primary colors because 
when they have an opportunity to discover green versus you just giving them the color green, you know, it can really like um, spark their imagination. And I remember thinking, oh, that's an interesting idea. I never thought about giving a kid the color green could steal a discovery from a kid. But when I actually taught kindergarten and first grade and I got a chance firsthand to witness kids go, oh, I made green. I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> Like that's, that's what they were talking about. So for me, the work that I do with reading is certainly about helping kids to become better readers, but it's also about helping them to discover things about themselves and what they like about the world or what they're interested in that hopefully will inspire a kind of lifelong love of reading and learning. For sure. And, you know, it's, it's funny now, especially with, uh, COVID and things of that nature, how, you know, education is where everybody's learning from home, you know, Zoom calls, things of that nature, right? So, so it talks about how, is, especially since the kids don't have a controlled environment where they're going to school, you know, the classroom is learning. And since that isn't there for them in the moment, what can happen, especially since the kids aren't reading since they're in school now, and, you know, some studies show that some kids are falling behind when it comes to like reading levels and things like that. So what are some things parents can encourage their kids to do is to make sure like they're continuing to read and maintain their reading levels? One of the, the things that I would say is modeling. So, you know, parents may add, have asked me like, what can I do to help my kid read? And I'm like, well, you know, how often do they see you reading? And they're like, oh no, no, I read to him sometimes. I'm like, no, 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 not how often do you read to him? Like how often does, you know, your child just see you reading? So that's one. I think creating opportunities to have family routines where everybody's just kind of reading and, and enjoying that is, is one thing parents can do. Another thing is just curating books around the interests of kids. So a lot of times parents will have ideas about what they want the kids to read. Like he needs to stop reading all them comic books. So he needs to do this or she needs to do that. And so I think creating opportunities for kids to just choose reading material that's just of interest to them, right? Yeah. Is something that you know families can do that I think will inspire more reading, especially during this time where for a lot of kids, the virtual learning environment may not be the most engaging. Yeah. Um, so those are the two things I would say that parents can do that could make a difference, you know, Cool. And then another question for you, remember you just brought up how you were in your classroom, then it became more diverse when you went to the advanced placement and that was like a more white class. So talk about like the importance of, you know, the black and brown kids just in schools around the world in general and the importance of reading at that level. Um, I think that, you know, diversity in children's literature culturally responsive kind of practices in the classroom are, are really important for inspiring black and brown children uh, to read and learn. Um, I think that, you know, one of the kind of things I've seen with children's literature right now is that a lot of the titles seem to focus either on oppression narratives that may kind of you know, focus on things that happened during the civil rights movement or either yeah. doing slavery, or they focus on affirmation narratives where the characters are kind of limited only to talk about how they're different. I love my skin. I love my yeah. hair, you know, and those things are all important, both the historical kind of narratives and then also these affirmation narratives. But I also think it's important just to recognize that those are not the only narratives, right? Yeah. There are lots of little black and brown children who may just want to read something about an adventure, right? That's not about how they're different or that's not about something that may have happened long ago. And I just think it's important to create opportunities for children to read those types of books and to let them know that it's, it's okay, that everything doesn't have to just be about things that happened in the past or how you're different, but that there's this whole world of stories out there for you. Definitely. And then lastly for you, I want to talk about your baby, uh, Barbershop Books. So tell us how that came into fruition, the kind of programs they offer. So, you know, I was teaching first grade in the Bronx. There was a barbershop across the street from my school. And I was 
getting a haircut. And one of my first graders came into the shop, plopped down on the couch, and was just sitting there kind of looking bored, getting antsy. And I just kept thinking to myself, oh, he needs to be practicing his reading. And I was like, oh, I wish I had a children's book with me, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of that chance encounter with one of my students that inspired the idea for barbershop books. Um, you know, that was back, you know, in 2008 or, or nine when I was teaching. Since then, you know, we've now begun distributing children's books to more than 100 barbershops across the country as well as community-based organizations. We now are distributing books, children's books, selected by children. So that's really important. Like our books aren't just what do I think or what do teachers or parents think, but we actually ask Black boys, what do they like to read? We also have now launched an e-library that has um, you know, kind of diverse, independently published children's books by Black and Brown authors that are available for free on our website at barbershopbooks.org. Um, and then also it has uh, read aloud videos or story time videos that the kids can just watch. Um, and then we've also been developing some supplemental literacy programs uh, for the summer and for schools. And so those are kind of still in development. We're still piloting some of that stuff, but we're really excited now that the pandemic has started to kind of settle down a little bit more to actually start are letting individual community members, churches sponsor reading spaces for their local barbershops. For sure. No, that's a beautiful thing, really, because I remember even like myself just kind of just dwelling my fingers in the barbershop, yep. uh, you know, brother or something like that, just waiting for my turn. So, and having those kind of books available makes time go by quicker and increases your reading level as well. So, major thing you're doing. Um, I saw JD Sports and Finish Line. We're really here about supporting the Black and Brown community, especially with this program, Community Voices. So we want to help you and invest in you as you invest into people. So we want to donate $20,000 to the Barbershop Books to help continue the message and what you're doing. I know that's wonderful. a long way. It will, it will definitely uh, be put to good work, um, expanding reading opportunities for Black and Brown children across the country. I want to say on behalf of barbershop books, all the barbers, all the uh, many people who support our work and who make it possible. Uh, and on behalf of all the children who are gonna benefit as a result of your support, I just wanna say a big thank you to Finish Line um, and to you as well. Oh, thank you, appreciate that, man. Cool, that's about it, man. I'll let you have the closing words as we uh, wrap this up. Yeah, I would love um, to just say that at the core of the work that we're doing at Barbershop Books, it's really about inspiring kids to read for fun, about connecting them to relevant reading role models, right? In the barbershop, we're connecting Black men to the early reading experiences of Black and Brown boys um, with the goal of inspiring them to read for fun. And so uh, with that, I just want to say, Thank you, um, you know, Finish Line for your donation and for uh, helping the babies read. Absolutely. The pleasure is ours, man. Cool. So that's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. Alvin, Irby, definitely check out all the resources you can to support the program. And yeah, it's a wrap. Thank you. And thank, thank you everybody for tuning in as well. Beautiful. So 